Why did I think that you were Jerome? Jerome. Why did I think that Jerome was coming? What is it? Hi everyone. For those of you trickling in, we're just going to give it a few more minutes just to let some last minute people hop on.
All right, I think we're good to get started. A good amount of people have come in. Um, as a disclosure, I live right next to the hospital. So if you hear a lot of sirens, that's what's happening. Um, all right, so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the sixth webinar of 2023, which is supported by the ACCP Immunology and Transplantation PRN's Programming Committee, as well as the New Practitioner Council. For those of you that don't, don't know me or haven't met me, I'm Johanna Papanicola. I'm the current PGY2 solid organ transplant resident at The Ohio State University. And it's my pleasure today to moderate today's webinar. Today, our webinar is our annual resident research showcase, and we are honored to have Isabel Baik, the PGY2 and solid organ transplant at Henry Ford Health. We have Sarah Nazarevic, PGY1 from University of Illinois at Chicago, Sydney Martinez, a PGY1 from St. Joseph's Hospital and Medical Center, and lastly, Mina Chow, the PGY2 and solid organ transplant at University of Cincinnati, and they will serve as our webinar presenters today. We'll get started in a moment, but just a quick few notes for everyone. For everyone in the audience, just make sure your microphones remain muted for the duration of today's presentation. If at any point during the presentation you have a question for the speaker, go ahead and just submit your questions directly to me using the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then that's just really to minimize any interruptions. And then we will take questions at the completion of the presentation. Today's webinar will be posted on the ACCP IMTR YouTube channel. And if you experience any technical difficulties during the duration of the webinar that aren't fixed by just logging out and logging back in or refreshing your internet connection, just go ahead and um, chat me and make me aware. And with that, we can go ahead and get started. Thank you, Joanna, for the introduction. Again, my name is Isabel Bake. I am the PGY2 transplant resident at Henry Ford Health in Detroit. And my project is on evaluating the use of glucagon like peptide 1 receptor agonist or GLP 1 RAs in a matched cohort of kidney and liver transplant recipients. By the end of this presentation, you should be able to identify the risk factors for metabolic complications after solid organ transplantation and discuss the safety and efficacy effects associated with the utilization of GLP-1s in post-transplant patients. A little bit about the background. So there are several transplant and non-transplant specific factors that lead to the development of post-transplant diabetes mellitus. These include immunosuppressive agents, infections, older age, higher BMI, allograft rejection that all increase the risk of PTDM and metabolic disease. Despite ADA guideline update recommendations, including GLP-1-RAs to help diabetes management, there was initial hesitancy in using in transplant recipients due to minimal data and the concerns with side effects. There are a few FDA-approved GLP-1s as a secure for type 2 diabetes and or weight loss. Depending on the agent and dose, the efficacy of GLP-1s that have been studied show an average weight loss of 2 to 6 kilograms and hemoglobin A1c percent decreased by 1 to 2 percent. Not only were GLP-1s shown to lower weight and hemoglobin A1c, some of the agents have FDA-approved cardiorenal benefits as well. With the weight, glycemic, and cardiorenal benefits seen with GLP-1s, more publications have recently come out with the GLP-1 use in transplant patients. The first study was done by Vigara and colleagues with 40 patients and found statistically significant reductions in A1c and weight with an increase in EGFR, with 12 adverse events noted of nausea and vomiting. Swiss and colleagues did a similar study where they utilized GLP-1s in 118 post-transplant patients and found similar statistical significant reductions in hemoglobin A1c and weight with an increase in EGFR. 10% of the patients experienced nausea and vomiting and 7% experienced hypoglycemia. 
Currently, the data regarding the safety and long-term efficacy of GLP-1 in transplant patients is limited. And so my study was looking at um, using GLP-1s in transplant recipients um, and with the major concerns associated with the use um, due to side effects, largely GI related, this is problematic as immunosuppressants can cause GI upset as well. So the purpose of my study was to evaluate the role of therapy of initiating a GLP-1 in both post kidney and liver transplant recipients. Rest. My primary outcome was looking at the change in median hemoglobin A1C from time of drug initiation to six months out. Secondary outcomes included overall insulin requirements, number of oral diabetic agents, uh, change in renal function, and weight and BMI. Safety endpoints included drug-related and graft outcomes as listed here, and I will go further in my presentation. Henry Ford Hospital is an 877-bed hospital. We have performed over 6,000 solid organ transplants, offering transplants in kidney, liver, pancreas, intestine, and multivisceral, heart, and blood. The study was a matched cohort of post-kidney and liver transplant recipients at Henry Ford Hospital who were newly initiated on a GLP-1 agent. The time period that was looked at were prescriptions initiated from January 2020 to January 2022. Patients were matched on two variables, which were organ type and if they had a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes at the time of their transplant. My study included adult patients, kidney or liver transplant recipients, and this had to be a newly initiation of GLP-1s, and they have to be on the agent for at least three months. My study was looked at using, um, the categor categorical data was using the McNamara tests where applicable, and my continuous data, data was analyzed using the Wilcox signed rank test, and statistical values were significant if they had a p-value of less than 0.05. Looking at my results, there were 37 patients identified who were newly initiated on a GLP-1 agent and matched to 37 patients that were not on a GLP-1 agent. Between the two cohorts, the median age was 60 years of age, primarily Caucasian and male patients. There were 20 patients uh, post-kidney and 17 post-liver, with the majority of patients receiving deceased donor transplant. 16 of the patients were matched in each group that had a history of type 2 diabetes at the time of their transplant. More patients were on insulin, and the number of overall units per day were higher in the GLP-1 than in the non-GLP-1 group. At baseline, there are more patients on oral diabetic agents in the GLP-1 group, and there were patients were initiated on an agent at varying time points post transplant, as noted here. 27% um, of them were initiated less than one year, and then 32% one to five years, and 40% greater than five years. For the primary outcome of change in hemoglobin A1C from baseline to month six, the GLP1 group decreased. 5.5 and the non-GLP-1 group increased by 0.8%. More patients in the GLP-1 group were able to achieve a hemoglobin A1C goal of less than 7% at month six. From baseline to six months, EGFR decreased by 9.5 mLs per minute in the GLP-1 group while increasing in the non-GLP-1 group by 7.5 mLs per minute. There wasn't a direct cause for why the GLP-1 um, EGFR decreased, but there were a lot of different confounding transmit factors that could have played into why we saw this. 
the change in weight was statistically significant for the GLP-1 group, and it decreased by 7.4 kilograms. And there was a minimal decrease by 0.3 kilograms in the non-GLP-1 group. BMI also decreased significantly in the GLP-1 group in comparison to the non-GLP-1 group. In terms of efficacy outcomes of, of diabetes management, patients that were started on a GLP-1 decreased overall number of insulin units by uh, six months, while uh, this number increased for the non-GLP-1 group. In addition, oral diabetic agents as well increased in the non-GLP-1 group while being the same for the GLP-1 group. Finally, in terms of the safety outcomes that I've looked at, there were 18 charted adverse events and seven of those were drug related. There were nine patients that discontinued the agent and majority of that was due to adverse events. And second most common reason was that patients found um, the drug not effective. There were no incidences of pancreatitis or mortality and the incidence of biopsy proven acute rejection was 22% but this was not compared to the non-GLP-1 group. And there was one incidence of grass loss, and this was um, due to immunosuppression not adherence. There are some limitations to the study to take into consideration that there is some selection bias as not everyone gets initiated on these agents post-transplant. Therefore, patients that have to be evaluated to be started on the agent or not. And there are also patient factors that have to be considered um, to determine if a patient is a candidate, for example, if they're able to eject themselves, or, as well as there's some inconsistencies with providers who decide to start patients on an agent based on their comfortability on using these agents post-transplant. In addition, there is accessibility and financial components that do play into using these agents as um, we would have to check if it was covered through their insurance. And finally, just being retrospective in nature makes it inferior compared to prospective studies. In conclusion, my study showed that although we didn't see statistical reductions in my primary results, we did see statistical and clinical reductions in weight, BMI, and insulin requirements for diabetes management. GLP-1s are beneficial in helping manage blood glucose or even as early as one month post-transplant. And my project showed that GLP-1s were safe with low incidences of serious adverse events that include mortality and heart loss. Based on my study findings and conclusions, we are developing a streamlined protocol for GLP-1 initiation at the transplant clinic. And also this will help implement a collaborative practice agreement for pharmacists to initiate and monitor GLP-1s in the post-transplant clinic setting. And finally, this may ultimately increase the overall comfortability of GLP-1 utilization in our post-transplant patient population. Here are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. I don't see any questions in my personal chat, but if anyone has them, please send them my way. But so far, nothing for you. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Sarah Nezrovic, and I'm currently a PGY1 resident at the University of Illinois in Chicago. And today we're gonna to be talking about my research project, which looked at the use of double strength versus single strength spectrum for prophylaxis of urinary tract infections in kidney transplant recipients. At the end of this presentation, you should be able to discuss both the efficacy and safety of the use of double strength spectrum versus single strength for UTI prophylaxis. 
So when discussing urinary tract infections, like we all know, they are the most common infectious complication amongst our kidney transplant recipients, widely varying anywhere with a prevalence rate of 7% up to 80% in this population. And the highest incidence of UTIs do tend to occur within that first three to six months post kidney transplant timeframe. And UTIs do account for roughly 30% of all hospitalizations for sepsis, along with implications of impaired graft function, graft loss, and death. Additionally, there are other uh, UTI risk factors out there that we do want to consider in our kidney transplant population, those being female gender, older age, the presence of diabetes, a urinary and dwelling catheter, urinal stents, specific medications like immunosuppressants, and any urological abnormalities like renal cysts, calculi, or malformations. Currently, the American Society or AST guidelines do list Bactrim as a relevant agent for six months specifically for the use of pneumocystitis gerobechi pneumonia or PJP pneumonia. However, Bactrim has also been shown to decrease UTI incidence along with bacteremia post kidney transplantation. So it is actually a preferred UTI uh, prophylactic agent as well for at least one month according to the AST guidelines. However, nowhere in the guidelines does it list a specific recommended dosing for Bactrim, specifically anywhere comparing single shrink versus double shrink dosing. However, there are some studies out there that have looked at the two dosing strategies. Khosrow Shahi and colleagues looked at 95 kidney transplant recipients, specifically that had received a high dose of Bactrim, which was considered to be the 1600 per 320 milligram dosing versus low to moderate dosing, which was our single shrink dosing of 400 per 80 milligrams or double shrink dosing of 100 per 160 milligrams, specifically for six months. And it was shown that there was a higher UTI incidence among our low to moderate dosing Bactrim population in comparison to our high dose that was statistically significant. Fox and colleagues looked at 580 patients for roughly eight and a half months that had received, again, this high dosing of Bactrim of 600 per 320 milligrams versus the moderate dosing, which was our double shrink dosing. And it was shown that there was a higher UTI prevention incidence amongst those patients that received the high dosing of Bactrim at 54% versus moderate dosing at 24%. When considering the use of Bactrim, it is important for us to realize that there are adverse reactions out there that we should look out for, including hyperkalemia, AKI, or leukopenia. There are alternative agents that we can use in place of Bactrim if patients are intolerable, those being nitrofurantoin, cephalexin, and fluoroquinolones. Talkoff Rubin and colleagues did look at 52 patients who had received either no prophylaxis versus moderate dosing prophylaxis with double shrink Bactrim for four months. And it was shown that patients that had received Bactrim overall in comparison to no prophylaxis did have higher incidence is of both leukopenia and skin reactions. Harbidell and colleagues also looked at roughly 1,200 patients that had either received the double dosing shrink the Bactrim or single dose shrink the Bactrim in comparison to no prophylaxis overall. And as a result, they had grouped just patients who had received either the double dose, double shrink or single shrink dosing of Bactrim together in comparison to no prophylaxis. And it had shown that there was a statistically higher percentage of patients that had adverse reactions specifically in relation to hyperkalemia. I wanted us to look at our current UTI prophylaxis protocol that we have in place right now at the University of Illinois Hospital. And we have been using double strength Bactrim, specifically one tablet every night for six months postoperatively. And if Bactrim is discontinued due to adverse reactions, we can initiate cephalexin for UTI prophylaxis. And then specifically for PJP prophylaxis, we can use dapsone or pantamidine. Additionally, in our protocol, it does state that if Bactrim is stopped, an alternative UTI prophylactic agent should be started. And comparing this to our old UTI prophylaxis protocol that we used to have in place, we were previously using single shrink Bactrim. Um, again, one tablet every night for six months, and the rest of the protocol had stayed 
the exact same. So you're probably wondering why did we have this transition from using single strength back drum in place uh, of using double strength back drum in place of single strength back drum. And this was actually had occurred in November of 2021 due to an observed increase of UTIs. So previously we were using the single strength back drum 400 per 80 milligrams daily, which we had revised to now use the back drum double strength 100 per 160 milligrams daily. So we had made this change and what had occurred out of this change? Did we see a decrease in UTIs after switching to double strength dosing? And this was exactly what my study had looked at to compare the efficacy and tolerability of single strength versus double strength back drum for UTI prophylaxis, specifically in the first six months post kidney transplant. This was a single center retrospective cohort study where we followed up with patients six months post transplant. And specifically if patients had received a kidney transplant anywhere from December 1st, 2020 to May 1st, 2021, this was considered to be our single strength population group since it had occurred prior to that change that we had made in November of 2021. And then patients who had received a kidney transplant anywhere from December 1st, 2021 to May 1st, 2022, this was considered to be our double shrink dosing population. We had included adult kidney transplant recipients and excluded any patients who did not receive a dose of Bactrim during index admission, along with excluding any multi-organ transplant recipients. Our primary endpoint looked at the comparative incidence of UTI, which we had defined as any positive urine culture with greater than 100,000 CFU and pyuria, regardless of symptoms, or any treated UTI that did not meet the above criteria. Our secondary endpoints included the comparative tolerability of single strength versus double strength Bactrim, which was defined as a discontinuation of Bactrim being the dose was held for greater than or equal to 14 days, or the dose was adjusted to a non-equivalent dose based on renal function. We looked at reasoning for discontinuation, looking at leukopenia, hyperkalemia, and AKI, while also looking at the percentage of patients started on alternative prophylaxis if Bactrim was discontinued, while also looking at the time to stent removal from date of transplant, inpatient treatment of UTI, percentage of patients receiving UTI prophylaxis at the time of diagnosis, the total duration of UTI prophylaxis, the time to UTI from transplant, along with the presence of urinal stents at the time of UTI. We looked at chi-square and Fisher's exact test for our categorical data, along with student t-test for our continuous data, and a sample size of 77 for both arms was needed to be met to consider UTI incidence with a 5% alpha error and 90% power. A total of 194 patients were screened where nine were excluded, specifically five due to patients having expired prior to the six month follow-up period, in addition to four patients having an allergy to Bactrim so they had not received a dose during index admission. As a result, we had a total of 185 patients with 90 patients in our single strength Bactrim group and 95 patients in our double strength group. As a result for our baseline characteristics, the majority of our patients were roughly 55 years old, male gender and of the African-American or Hispanic descent, which is that of the typical population that we would see here at UIH. When looking at our primary outcome of UTI incidence, so you would think that De increasing our dose and going from single strength to double strength, you would have assumed a decrease in UTI incidence. However, there was no difference in the percentage of patients who had a UTI within the first six months. And we had looked at specifically the percentage of patients who had had a um, one or more UTI specifically for this outcome. There was a statistically higher percentage of patients who had a discontinuation of Bactrim in our double strength group. And this was specifically in relation to adverse reactions, as we can see here, most commonly being leukopenia and hyperkalemia, and then AKI and allergy followed thereafter, and other which was considered to be a dose adjustment that was not equivalent to the prior renal adjustment. 
for our patients started on alternative prophylaxis, there was a higher percentage of patients in our double strength group that were started on an alternative UTI prophylactic agent if Bactrim was discontinued. And this was specifically looked at out of the total number of incidents of occurrences of UTIs. When looking at our inpatient treatment of UTI, patients receiving prophylaxis at the time of UTI and then the time to UTI at median days, this was also um, similar amongst the two groups, looking at both the single strength and double strength dosing. For the presence of urinal stents at the time of UTI, this was also similar amongst the two groups here. However, the time to stent removal was actually significantly reduced in our double strength group, as we can see looking at 28 days versus 37 days in the single strength group. This study was a retrospective study, which could be a possible limitation. However, there was also inconsistency for documentation of reasoning of why Bactrim dis was discontinued, which did make it difficult at times to determine the exact reasoning. And in January of 2022, we had actually updated our Valgan Cyclovir dosing protocol, which had resulted in a dose increase of Valgan Cyclovir. So there could have been patients at the time who had a higher incidence of leukopenia due to this. In conclusion, looking at Bactrim double strength, it did not reduce UTI incidence specifically in the first six months post kidney transplant. However, there was earlier stent removal and the initiation of alternative agents that you think would also contribute to a decrease in UTI. However, it did not. And as of future results, we have actually currently changed our protocol here at UIH. So we are now going back to using single strength dosing in place of our double strength uh, dosing. So we have actually switched back to our initial protocol as a result of the study. And going forward, I think it would also be beneficial to look at the appropriate duration of UTI prophylaxis, since I had mentioned um, it can vary anywhere from the first three to six months post kidney transplant. So I think it would also be beneficial to look at appropriate dur duration going forward. These are my acknowledgments and references as well. Thanks, Sarah. Um, definitely insightful, as I agree with you. I think it's there's a lot of variability program to program, and duration is a whole other beast. Um, there are two questions for you from Dr. Alloway. The first one is, due to the high rate of reported sulfa allergies, does your program have a strategy for identifying a true sulfa allergy? Yeah, when looking through just documentation, like I mentioned, I think that was a um, limitation of the study was just improper or inconsistency in documentation. Um, so I think it was just considered to be if um, patients had a previous listed allergy to sulfa, whether that was a true allergy of like hives or anaphylaxis, um, and they hadn't tolerated it is what we had considered to be a documented allergy. Um, if they had listed it in, um, in the chart as an allergy, and then if it was um, listed just amongst the notes as well. Thank you. And then the second question um, from Dr. Alloway is, my clinical opinion is that prophylaxis is too frequently discontinued due to leukopenia and hyperkalemia when there are many other causes of these adverse events. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I um I think I also agree. Like I had mentioned, like we had changed our Balgan Cyclovir um, dosing protocol at the same time. So there are other immunosuppressive agents out there that can also contribute to leukopenia that I think maybe we um, overlook at times. So I think there are other possible reasonings out there that could have could be contributing to adverse reactions alone that I think we should consider prior to. Um, abruptly just discontinuing UTI prophylaxis, specifically Bactrim due to those adverse reductions. And then I just have a quick question for you, and this is just because uh, I'm curious, for those discontinuation reasons, how did you collect that? Did you just like chart dig? Were those documented or uh, how difficult was it to find like why Bactrim was 
reduced or held or any of those? Yeah, um, I did just have to do a lot of chart digging and then kind of looking at the lab values as well. So if they had listed leukopenia as a reasoning for discontinuation, I would go and look at um, like the CBC with differential as well, along with looking at like potassium levels um, and serum creatinine. Um, so it was had it was a lot of chart digging along with just trying to compare like the timing of the chart with the labs at the time as well. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think that's it for you, Sarah. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Sydney Martinez, and today I'll be presenting on my research, evaluating the efficacy and safety of latirmavir compared to valgancyclovir for the prevention of human cytomegalovirus disease in adult lung transplant recipients. Uh, my co-authors and I have no conflicts of interest to disclose except for the one noted here, and we received no funding for this research. My learning objective today is to discuss the potential beneficial outcomes of transitioning lung transplant recipients from valgancyclovir to latirmavir for CNV prophylaxis. I do have an associated assessment question, so which of the following outcomes is most likely to occur when transitioning a patient to latirmavir? The options are cost savings, leukopenia recovery, decrease in immunosuppression requirements, or reduction in CMV rates. So this research was conducted at St. Joseph's Hospital Medical Center in Phoenix, Arizona. It is a 595-bed quaternary care facility home to Norton Thoracic Institute, which is a high-volume lung transplant center. So what is CMV? CMV is a human herpes virus present in about 50% of the population by age 40, and this can cause significant disease in our immunocompromised patient population. Lung transplantation specifically has the highest immunosuppression targets of any organ, therefore leaving this patient population at increased infection vulnerability. Without adequate prophylaxis, the incidence of CMV disease in our lung transplant recipients ranges from 54 to 92%. Duration of prophylaxis in our lung transplant recipients is variable. The American Society of Transplant Infectious Diseases recommends at least 6 to 12 months, with some centers prolonging to greater than 12 months. A 2010 survey of CMV prophylaxis duration showed variation from none to lifelong. Of note, most lifelong prophylaxis occurred in the high-risk CMV category, and that's important because over 25% of our lung transplants are in this high-risk category. While valgancyclovir is the drug of choice for CMV prophylaxis, there is a novel drug, latirmavir, that is FDA approved for CMV prophylaxis in hematopoietic stem cell transplant recipients. And as of earlier this month, after these slides were submitted, is also FDA approved for kidney transplant CMV prophylaxis as well. And this is just a mechanism of action showing the novel uh, mechanism of action of latirmavir compared to our standard of care valgancyclovir or gancyclovir noted here. So previous literature of latirmavir in solid organ transplant is limited since until recently there was no indication for a solid organ transplant CMV prophylaxis. So these five studies here um, are all retrospective in nature and have very few lung transplant patients included, ranging from zero to 37. Most of these studies evaluate latirmavir alone, transitioning from valgancyclovir. However, there is one study that matched one to two latirmavir to valgancyclovir. Of note, the incidence of DNAemia or CMV breakthrough varies in the studies from 13 to 47 percent. Of note, the white blood cell count change is also reported in some of these studies, since latirmavir is um, usually switched from valgancyclovir in patients with leukopenia. So in the second study here, you can see that there was a recovery of the white blood cell count within normal limits, so from 1% to 88% after the transition to latirmavir. And in the next two studies, you can see that the actual white blood cell count did improve from 1.9 to 4.5 and 3.1 to 5 after transitioning to latirmavir. So the methodology of this uh, presentation is a single center retrospective match cohort study that included adult lung transplant recipients on either latirmavir or valgancyclovir for CMV prophylaxis. Patients had to be on latirmavir for at least three months of therapy to be included. Our exclusion criteria include latirmavir initiated for combination therapy or used for CMV disease treatment initially. 
and patients um, must not have died during their initial transplant hospitalization. I did want to quickly review um, the protocols at our hospital for lung transplant. So our induction varies. We prefer basiliximab, but we have other two options of rituximab or antithymocyte globulin, and all patients receive IV steroids as well. Our maintenance suppression includes a combination of a calcineurid inhibitor, an antiproliferative agent, and a steroid. We do start our patients on opportunistic, prophylaxis, opportunistic infection prophylaxis, specifically for CMV. The dosing depends on the risk category. So for our high and intermediate risk patients, they are started on valgancyclovir, 450 milligrams twice daily. And for our low risk, valgancyclovir, 450 milligrams daily, both on post-op day four. And at our center, we continue lifelong CMV prophylaxis. Our other agents of choice for the other OIs are Bactrim for PJP and itraconazole for fungal prophylaxis. So the primary endpoint of the study was the incidence of CMV breakthrough on either prophylaxis therapy. Secondary endpoints include measures of CMV de-anemia episodes. We looked at various hematological outcomes and evaluated adverse drug effects and prophylaxis discontinuation rates. All patients were assessed for up to 12 months or, or until prophylaxis failure or loss to follow-up. So we did match our patients, the latamivir, 2 valgan cyclovir, based on the CMV risk status, so high, intermediate, or low. We matched based on age at transplant, plus or minus two years. And the valgan cyclovir patients must have survived to time post-transplant for latamivir initiation. This means that we would take our latamivir patient and count the number of days from their transplant to initiation of latamivir and input those number of days into the valgan cyclovir patient. So for example, if 200 days passed between the transplant and latamivir initiation, we would put 200 days into the valgan cyclovir patient from transplant and then day 200 is when we would start our data collection for that patient. So overall, there were 215 latamivir patients evaluated from the beginning of 2019 through mid-2022. 65 of them were excluded, a majority of which um, had insurance or cost issues or did not complete at least three months duration to be included. And a majority of those patients with less than three months did have additional insurance cost issues. So overall, 150 patients were data collected on. However, after data collection before matching, four patients were excluded. One was a minor and three patients initiated latimavir eight to 10 years after transplantation, which made matching two valgan cyclovir very difficult with the timelines. Therefore, there were 146 patients included in each arm of this study. So for a quick review of some of the baseline characteristics, the average age was 64 between the two groups and the majority of the patients were white males. Um, of note, there is a larger proportion of group D restrictive lung disease as a transplant indication in both groups. 96% of patients initiated on latirvir were done so due to leukopenia secondary to valgan cyclovir. And this is important for evaluating the next two medications. So Bactrim use was higher than the other prophylaxis agents in both groups, which is as expected since this is our protocol. However, the use in the latamivir group of Bactrim was lower, and this was likely due to the holding of ch or changing of the prophylaxis due to the additive myelosuppression and leukopenia effects that Bactrim has. Similarly, more patients had MMF held in their immunosuppression regimens, as this medication is also held or reduced to compensate for leukopenia levels. So none of this is surprising, but it's important to note. And lastly, our CFV sera status. So as this is a matching factor, it's the same in both groups. So 60% of our patients were in the intermediate risk with 32% of patients in the high risk category. For our primary outcome of CMV breakthrough, there was four patients in each group that had an episode. So an incidence of 2.7% in each group, which was not statistically significant. Since there were few patients, I outlined a chart here of the eight patients. Seven of the eight were the high-risk mismatch category. Two of the patients in the latamivir group had a prior history of CMV, and this could indicate a prior failure on valgan and cyclovir. Days post-transplant to CMV breakthrough ranged. However, CMV breakthrough occurred less than one year from index or latamivir initiation in all patients. All the patients were successfully treated and placed on appropriate secondary prophylaxis with 100% six-month survival rate in this group. 
For our secondary outcomes, we evaluated white blood cell count at initiation and one year post in each medication group. So in the latirovir group, you could see that there is a initiation white blood cell count of 3.0 leukopenic and improved to 5.3, which was statistically significant. And there was no difference in the Valgan cyclovir group. In the uh, graph on the left, this represents the percent of leukopenia patients at various time points. So of no surprise, the latirovir group had a higher percentage of leukopenia at baseline, which quickly resolved and improved compared to Valgan cyclovir. In the image on the right, this represents the percent of leukopenia throughout the time among patients who were initially leukopenic at baseline. So both groups had 100% at baseline with latimavir with rapid improvement compared to Valgan cyclovir of the leukopenia episodes. For our other hematological outcomes, we evaluated the number of episodes of leukopenia, neutropenia, and thrombocytopenia. Across the board, all with great improvement in the latimavir group, which was statistically significant and uh, comparatively Valgan cyclovir, which did not have an across the board improvement. For our safety outcomes, we had both high follow-up and prophylaxis continuation rates. Latimavir was less continued to last follow-up due to cost or insurance issues, as this was the number one reason for discontinuation. Of note, death rates were seen to be higher in the latimavir group. However, we are not attributing this to the drug or CMV itself. I evaluated each of the patients in both groups that had death before one year follow-up and noted that over 50% of the patients in the latimavir group had cancer or COVID as their um, diagnosis during their death hospitalization, which makes sense because the latimavir patients were evaluated during the COVID time, so 2019 to 2022, and our Valgan cyclovir was a historical cohort prior to in 2018. Um, so likely, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic did affect these in the incidence rates. We did have uh, a very low percent of ADE in both groups and low discontinuation due to ADE. It is important to note that 96% of the patients, as I said earlier, were initiated on latimavir due to failed valgan cyclovir secondary to leukopenia. So although the ADE rates do look very similar here, they are much higher in the valgan cyclovir group. So overall, similar CMV breakthrough rates in both groups in the setting of patients with full CMV suppression was seen. Latimavir is associated with the resolution of leukopenia with high tolerability and low cessation rates. The strengths of the study include a high occluded population with prolonged CMV prophylaxis, a historical control group, and larger sample size than prior studies. Some limitations include the Timorvir accessibility issues, which impacted inclusion and continuation rates, and of course, the retrospective nature of this presentation, uh, this research. So overall, the current study results indicate that latimavir started in virally suppressed patients could be a safe alternative for CMV prophylaxis in lung transplant recipients. Latimavir prophylaxis may be preferred for patients experiencing persistent leukopenia on Valgan cyclovir. And this is just my review question. Any questions? Thank you, Sydney. But yeah, definitely excited, as you mentioned, uh, regarding this newer approval for Latermavir. Hopefully access won't be much of an issue. Um, there is a question in the chat from Dr. Alloway. Okay. She says, in patients who develop CMV viremia, do you continue prophylaxis lifelong if they convert to CMV IgG positive? That's a very interesting question. Um, our center as a whole continues lifelong prophylaxis regardless for all of the lung transplant recipients. I don't know the specifics um, regarding your question, but I can look into it and get back to you. And then another question, um, did you evaluate for the use of GCSF or any of those products? Yes, we did. So um, I didn't mention it. So we did evaluate for GCSF and this was statistically significant in latimavir. So uh, pre one year pre-initiation in latimavir, 32% use. And then after latimavir, one year post 11%, which was statistically significant. And in the Valgan cyclovir group, the percentage was the same, which was not statistically significant. Thank you so much. I don't see anything else for you. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today and for allowing me the opportunity to present on behalf of our team. My name is Mina Chow. I am currently a PGY2 transplant pharmacy resident at the University of Cincinnati. Today, I will be presenting on the impact of COVID-19 on Belatacep and tacrolimus treated kidney transplant recipients from a prospective randomized multicenter trial. And throughout this presentation, my goal are to compare COVID-19 hospitalization and mortality outcomes between kidney transplant recipients and the general population. Explain proposed mechanisms of Belatacep versus tacrolimus related to COVID-19 on the immune system. Review Belatacep early steroid withdrawal or the best trial and discuss the objective methodology and results of this COVID-19 retrospective study. Currently, the impact of immunosuppression on COVID outcomes in kidney transplant recipients is poorly understood. Despite limited data assessing COVID outcomes in kidney transplant recipients compared to the general population, 30-day mortality rate and hospitalization have been reported to be similar between the two groups. Since the patients in this study were receiving either belatacep or tacrolimus as their primary immunosuppression, I wanted to talk about these a little bit. Belatacep is a co-stimulation blocker with a long half-life of about 10 days, while tacrolimus is a calcineurin inhibitor with a shorter half-life of less than 36 hours. The long half-life of belatacep may contribute to the difficulty of treating viral infections. Belatacep reduces immune response by modulating T follicular helper cell B cell crosstalk, as well as reducing plasma plus differentiation, immunoglobulin production, and expression of major transcription factors involved in plasma cell function. Additionally, SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells express CD28, which may theoretically be inhibited by belatacep. On the other hand, tacrolimus is proposed to exhibit some COVID protective effects. Active immunophilin pathway positively influences intracellular coronavirus replication. CNI is able to inhibit calcineurin only when it binds with, um, with the immunophilin, which is FKBP12 or cyclophilin which blocks the replication of coronaviruses. Vaccine response rates is also seen um, lower in belatacep compared to tacrolimus. However, more doses of vaccine seem to increase response. And the patients analyzed in our study came from the BEST trial, which was a prospective randomized and multi-center study evaluating the safety and efficacy of belatacep versus tacrolimus when combined with early steroid withdrawal in the novel kidney transplant recipients. The BEST trial has three different treatment arms. All patients receive either alentuzumab or thymol for induction combined with MMS or and steroid first withdrawal. Or other. Right. Patients mm -hmm. also receive either Bella or TAC as their primary immunosuppression. And just to give some context of the sequence of events, enrollments for BEST trial began in 2012 and ended four mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. later mm -hmm. in 2016. Mm -hmm. Another four years later, the first COVID case in the US was reported in January 2020. Almost three years later, COVID data, um, almost three years later, COVID data collection and analysis were performed in November 2022. Therefore, the patients in our COVID analysis are kidney transplant recipients who are more than three years out from their transplant before they contracted COVID. This study is important because it provides the first evidence comparing the impact of COVID-19 in kidney transplant recipients randomized to belatacep versus tacrolimus-based immunosuppression regimen. The objectives of this studies are to compare COVID outcomes, including COVID positive case rate, 
hospitalization and death between treatment groups and also to evaluate the impact of COVID vaccination status on COVID outcomes by treatment groups. The best trial had 316 patients, 170 of those were local patients. 37 patients were excluded in our COVID analysis due to death, graft loss, and loss to follow up before 2020, as well as not having COVID data available in EHR. 133 patients were included in our COVID analysis. Patients from the best group A and B receiving Bella were combined into one Bella group, which has 86 patients. Patients from the best group C made up 47 patients in the TAC group. Statistical tests performed are shown on this slide. A p-value of less than 0 0.05 is considered statistically significant. Baseline characteristics known to impact COVID infections post-transplant uh, were similar between treatment groups. To show their immunosuppression regimens immediately prior to COVID, the groups were compared as follows. No difference observed in BMI, diabetes, use of mTOR or prednisone, and MMS doses. Vaccine rates were similar between treatment groups with only 23% unvaccinated or not reported in Bella group versus 11% in TAP group. In this heavily vaccinated population, approximately 80% of patients were confirmed to have received at least two vaccine doses. COVID positive case is defined as having EHR documentation of COVID-19 positive with a test date without differentiating between PCR and antigen tests. We found that COVID positive case rates were similar between groups, 42% in Bella group versus 40% in TAC group. However, among patients who tested positive for COVID, Bella group had a significantly lower vaccine rate compared to TAC group, 50% in TAC in Bella versus 84% in TAC. Immunosuppression changes at the time of COVID positive tests were similar between treatment groups. COVID treatment recommendations were evolving during this time. As noted, most patients did receive some form of COVID treatment, many of which are currently not available in, or in use. COVID hospitalizations rate were also similar between two groups, 16% in Bella versus 11% in TAC. Among patients who were hospitalized Due to COVID, 29% in Bella group versus 60% in TAC group received at least two vaccine doses. Again, most patients received some forms of COVID treatment. COVID deaths were also similar between the two groups, five patients in Bella versus two patients in TAC group. Among patients who died due to COVID, 80% um, in Bella group versus 0% in TAC group were either unvaccinated or vaccine not reported, which make us think COVID vaccine helps prevent COVID deaths. However, two patients in TAC group still die after having received at least two vaccine doses. Unfortunately, we cannot make any definitive conclusion on this due to small sample size. Here are the COVID treatments they received prior to COVID death. And our univariant analysis shows that African-American race, pre-transplant diabetes, and having less than two COVID vaccine doses were associated with an increased risk of COVID hospitalization. I think I might have advanced one too early. Um, Covariance from 
univariate analysis that had p-values of less than 0.1 were included in the multivariate analysis. African-American race and having less than two COVID vaccine doses were significant predictors of COVID hospitalization. Pre-treatment diabetes approach is significant with an odds ratio of 2.76. Um, and this is a significant predictors in the general population. And in conclusion, this study was conducted in a heavily vaccinated group comparing Belatacept versus Tacrolimus treated kidney transplant recipients. Treatments with either Belatacept or Tacrolimus did not appear to influence risk of COVID-19 hospitalization or death. Predictors of COVID-19 hospitalizations were African-American race, less than two COVID vaccine doses, and potentially pre-transplant diabetes. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you, Mina. There's one question in the chat, and it is, was your study powered to show a difference? Um, we did not perform um, power calculations in this study because we just included all patients that were um, that met our inclusion criteria from the best trial. Thank you. That's all I have for you. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining.